Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creating Your News Diet. This is one of the monthly webinars in our summer series. It is being recorded, and a link will be sent to all registrants, and you'll receive a link to, to that recording on YouTube sometime this afternoon. We will also have time for questions, both recorded and unrecorded, at the end. And so first things first, this is what we're going to look at today. We're going to have a brief overview of what it is we're talking about, and then we're going to dive into understanding the news landscape and then developing a critical thinking lens when it comes to the news. Then we're going to move on to curating your news list and then tips for effective consumption. And finally, we're going to wrap up with some recommended news sources and some Q&A. So first things first. What are we talking about today? So why would you want to create a balanced and informed news diet? Well, you live in the world. You need to know what's happening to navigate it efficiently and successfully. And so being more aware helps you make decisions both about your personal life and for things like, you know, voting. We have lots of elections coming up and it's important to know what's going on. There are also some challenges of keeping up. You know, there's only so much news you can consume in a single day, and it feels like news is being blasted at you from all angles and myriad ways. And so some things you have to consider is your self-care in this process. You have to know what your limits are, and you have to know what stories you can consume easily versus what may be triggering to you. And only you are the person who can know that. And so that's where we can talk about setting boundaries. It's okay to set boundaries on what you need and want to consume when it comes to the news. And that's what we're doing this for, is to get this idea of what news is available to you and how you might want to keep up. So the goal of this whole webinar is to help you decide how to be informed, but not overwhelmed. And so let's start by looking at the news landscape and just how we got here. So back in the day, and honestly, it really wasn't that long ago, you turned to traditional news sources. And I'm thinking of things like print newspapers, broadcasts, and some early online news resources. And in general, and again, this is just in general, there are always exceptions, traditional news sources had a limited release schedule. They were issued daily, or maybe you got a morning edition and an evening edition, or they were issued weekly, monthly, or quarterly, but there tended to be a set news schedule. There was also an editing process that this material came to, and the people collecting the news often worked what we called beats. That means they specialized in one specific area of news coverage. And most of the time, you could consume these things in a very, you know, routine pattern because you had to go out and seek them. And part of the reason we call these traditional news sources is they actually had to go out and be printed. It took time to create these, you know, printing presses only move so quickly. And so essentially there's a general routine to when the news came out and how you went about staying informed on current events. And yes, there were always exceptions, but for the most part, you knew what to expect and when to expect it. And then we had the rise of 24-7 news media. And this is where I have to say, thanks, CNN. And that's mostly because of their coverage of the very first Gulf War. Technology at the time made it possible for news to literally be shared as it was happening. And CNN was one of the first that reported from an active war zone from a hotel room. They literally got on the phone and called in to their newsroom to discuss what was happening in the moment. And so this was the rise of 24-7 news cycle. News was still traditional in the sense that the same topics were covered and there was an editing process. Now it was shared far more often. And it, what really started to drive things was that TV news was looking to fill their schedule. They had to fill 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And now we've moved into the era where everyone makes news. You know, most of us have cell phones with cameras and we all have the ability to report the news using something that is in our pocket or with us at all times. And so think about all the news you have learned that was first reported by, you know, a bystander. It was literally someone there, they're not a trained reporter, and suddenly they can take a photo of a video or something that's happening. Or back in the day, we used to live tweet events, you know, news could be happening at any time. And social media became the easiest outlet for people to post what they share. So Twitter, you know, now we call it X, people would literally tweet about news happening as it was happening. 
And I also want to give a particular shout out to TikTok these days because it made sharing and commenting on the news even easier because people could stitch reports together of what's happening. And this is only continuing to happen now. TikTok is the number one source of where Generation Z and Gen Alpha actually get their news these days. And so today there are a lot of emerging platforms, but also issues that go with them. News is becoming more individualized. We are putting ourselves in bubbles because of personal personalization. And this is all due to the various algorithms that are out there. Platforms are not only giving us what we want, but they're not giving us necessarily what we need. And that means that we can miss things. There are whole areas of news you might not be hearing simply because the algorithm is only feeding you what you've been viewing. And also there's the increasingly rapid spread of misinformation. And some of this is deliberately constructed and some of it is just rumors that take flight. And you can't always take what you read, see, or hear at face value. And the increase of Gen, uh, Gen AI is only making this worse. And it's making misinformation easier to make and easier to spread. And also email newsletters and podcasts and other niche platforms are exploding because, you know, those traditional news outlets keep cutting budgets and staff. And those reporters have to go somewhere. So you will often have reporters from these traditional news sources having to start their own newsletters because they no longer have a job at, say, the New York Times. And so they're deciding, you know what, I still want to be a reporter, so I'm going to make my own newsletter. And so this decline of the traditional news media is happening because it's expensive. Keeping offices all over the world and the tech to keep them running is a lot. And well-trained and dedicated reporters cost even more. And so traditional news has too much overhead. And so they're letting their staff go and cutting what they cover. And this is actually happening if you've been paying attention to the Washington Post right now. There have been a lot of news buyouts. There's been a reduction in local news coverage. But now they're trying to move into a dedicated online newsroom where they're going to focus on things like email newsletters and TikTok. And what comes with this is the rise of paywalls. There is a saying that information wants to be free, but everyone tends to forget the second half of that saying, which is, but it also wants to be expensive. Good work takes time and money. People need to be compensated for that labor somehow. And paywalls are following that subscription model. And so instead of paying for, say, one you know, newspaper, now you're having to decide, well, how many do I pay for? How many newsletters? How many online accounts do I pay for so that I can stay informed? And so you can either end up paying for an entire publication or simply paying by the story. You often say, hey, if you want to keep reading, pay a dollar for one day's access. And so this is where there has been a rise in the phrase, the truth is paywalled, simply because good reporting is expensive and we need to pay for that labor somehow. And so sadly, you just can't read and assume that everything you see these days is true. And as I mentioned earlier, AI is making this harder. But mostly it's still the same old issues. You know, people start saying one thing and then they take it as gospel. And that's not necessarily the case. So when you are considering the news in front of you, there are a couple of things you want to consider. The first is recognizing biases and agendas. And those can be political, cultural, commercial, or, you know, simply personal. People have personal biases as well. There is power in controlling access to information. People want you to hear certain things, and those things may or may not be true. And this is extremely important when it comes to elections and money. Always keep an eye out for if someone is trying to tell you, sell you something or persuade you to act in a certain way, they're going to have a bias behind that. So that is why it's important to fact check and verify. So when you read something, consider how many places are saying that. And this is getting harder because it's very easy to duplicate news these days. There are actual content farms out there that put out, you know, a single story on multiple platforms to make it seem like it's true when really it's coming from just one person. And so you oftentimes have to consider what's the original source of this information? You know, is it coming from a reporter? who has done a lot of digging, or is it coming from, say, a politician who's trying to win an election? So you always have to consider the original source of the news. 
And you also have to wonder, is this an anonymous source? Now, anonymous sources can be great. Anonymous sources brought us leaks like, you know, the Pentagon Papers and things like that. But anonymous sources can also just be there to cloud someone's judgment because they don't want their name out there. You also want to look at dates. When did this come out? And then does the timeline of how this all happened make sense? You know, if someone said, oh, I heard something years ago, but then the timestamp on something is only six months ago, that should give you pause. And you can also watch out for obvious red flags like bad grammar in AI. AI generated photos always have trouble with human hands. So these are things you can keep an eye on. And finally, you have to consider what is credible versus what is clickbait. As I mentioned earlier, news farms exist. They are literally designed to churn out content to get you to click so that they can make money off of the ad revenue or the products they're trying to get you to buy. If you see a story that's like, you won't believe what happened and you're, you know, you have that emotional need to click, anytime there's that emotional drive, that is something that is clickbait. It is trying to get you to click and read that story for a reason. You also want to consider what is the editing process? Is this going through a traditional editor where a journal, journalist goes out, gathers all this information, writes a story, it goes through multiple rounds of editing before it is published? Or it is simply someone who's decided to throw something on Twitter? You know, with no editing process, it's just something they've decided it's true. So consider what is the editing process that that piece of news goes through? And then also consider how long has that news source been around? Now, there may be a new email newsletter out there, but that journalist may have a deep history in working with several dedicated news publications. So you always have to read the about pages of these information sources to learn more about them. And then you might also want to consider where does their funding come from? You might find a great resource, but if their funding comes from a political action committee, that might tell you something about that news organization's bias. And there's also news organizations out there that go around buying up local news media and then saying you can only publish certain sorts of stories. So always wonder where the funding for these organizations come from. And most of that information is available on a news source's about page. And if you're reading something and it doesn't have an about page and doesn't tell you where its funding comes from, that should give you pause because you need to know, you know, what's in it for you. And so how can you stay informed about what's happening? Well, we have some tips and we're going to walk you through some ideas for how to curate your news list. So first, identify your interests and your information needs, whether those are personal or professional. And then on top of that, decide what are your priorities? What is it most important for you to know most often? And you also want to consider selecting a diverse and balanced news source list. You know, you want to stay informed about what you're interested in, but then you might also want to consider, okay, but what is the other side saying about this? So when it comes to our basic recommendations for how to stay informed, but not be overwhelmed, we recommend following, you know, this sort of recipe. And again, you can adapt this to work for you. One international source of news coverage, one national source of news coverage, one local source of news coverage, one hyperlocal source of news coverage, and then, you know, three to five niche interests. And the reason for this is because you want to stay in the loop, but not be consuming so much that you can't keep up. And a lot of these places duplicate each other. So in some instances, you might only need to find one or two outlets that best for you. So for example, I used to follow over a dozen different news outlets, and after years of deleting a ton of email, I finally streamlined to just three major providers, since that's what you know I realized I needed, and I got to stay up to date on the news without seeing too much repeat news coverage or too much information that I didn't need. So you can adapt this to work for you. So if you're particularly driven to know about international news, maybe you want two or three sources there. And if you don't really care so much about local issues, you don't have to follow those. Only you can decide how much news and what kind of coverage you want and need. And so here are some tips for how to stay, to stay alert, but not overwhelmed. And everyone is different. So again, find what works best for you. So first, Pace yourself and develop a routine for check-in. You know, consider checking your email newsletters maybe once in the morning and once at night. You know, always on, getting all of those news alerts and notifications on your phone may seem great, 
but then it can become impossible to manage the flow. So try to have it where maybe you're only alerted to very important breaking international news. You might also want to consider quality over quantity. It is better to pay for one quality news source, then read a bunch of free places that have iffy reputations. And you don't have to read everything. You can skim the headlines uh, um, or the first paragraphs. In traditional news style, they put the most important information at the top, and then it gets, you know, not less necessary, but maybe less important the further you go down in the story. And also, you can just skip what you have no interest in at all. Don't feel like you have to read something simply because it landed in your inbox. And so you also want to strike a balance, you know, mix it up. Follow a mix of traditional, say, newspaper, TV, or radio coverage, and then emerging platforms, say, newsletters or TikTok to get a well-rounded look at events. You're gonna get a slightly different angle if you follow the same story on the New York Times as you would some creator on TikTok. And you might also wanna to strive to have various you know, viewpoints. You can see things from a conservative, liberal, or middle of the road path, and it's good to get a mix of all of it because everyone's gonna have a different opinion on these things. And speaking of opinions, you wanna consider, is this fact? versus is this opinion? And sometimes that is not always clear. So make sure you read into what kind of information it is. An opinion is fine, but not at expense of the truth. So if someone is a columnist, are they a columnist who's simply reporting the facts? Are they a columnist who's giving their biased analysis of something? And generally in traditional news sources, these land on what is called the op-ed pages. And so that's how you can differentiate between fact or opinion in a traditional news source. And then you also want to consider the source of who made that news and then who shared it. What's in it for them? You know, cops will always want to make cops look good. And the same goes for politicians. You know, businesses are trying to sell you something. So if they're putting out their own news, it's, you know, Apple's going to want to sell some Apple products to you. You might also want to consider who owns the source. State-run media and companies have known biases. As I mentioned earlier, there are certain syndication services that are more conservative or more liberal, and they go around and buy up local news sources. So always go to those about pages to learn more about those resources. And then there is this wonderful interactive chart from Ad Fontis, and it's their Ad Fontis Media Bias Chart. And this discusses the political bias of a source and if it's more opinion or more fact-based. And you can search for specific outlets or just click around to learn. And this includes all manner of outlets from major news sources to very tiny ones covering a range of hard news and entertainment. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop the link to this in the chat. And also since you've registered today, I will send the link to this resource out uh, in the follow-up and we share the recording of this. And so you might wanna explore that if you're looking for say more hard news News, you can focus on something that is more evidence-based. Or if you want more opinion, you can focus on something that's more opinion-based. And then as you'll see, you can also see, you know, the reliability, you know, is this fact-checked media versus is this more emotional-based media? And this is one of the number one sources for finding information and then helping you verify what kind of content they offer. And when you click on one of their pages, you learn a lot more about this single information source. And so another thing I want to talk about before we move on to the next section is to beware of breaking news. Breaking news is literally happening right now. And so you do want to be aware of it, particularly if it's happening in your local area. But you must remember that things are still developing and they will change. This is a certainty. And I want to, you know, go back in history to when the attacks of September 11th happened. At the time when the plane first hit the tower, we thought it was a small local, you know, commuter plane and it was an accident. Later, we learned, obviously, that that was incorrect. We also thought at the time that upwards of 15,000 people had been killed when the towers collapsed. But ultimately, over the course of that day, I believe it was just under 3,000 people had died. This is what happens when massive breaking news events happen. Things change and updates to that are not always clearly made. In fact, we are just now learning, and it's, you know, nearly 20 years later that, you know, Saudi Arabia was deeply connected to the attacks on September 11th, and that's just coming out now. 
as journalists keep digging on that. And so when it comes to breaking news, you have to, yes, pay attention, but you may have to go out and go back and seek updates on your own to that information to be sure you're getting the most up-to-date information. Most major wire services and news websites these days will have live blogs or live updates of critical breaking news. Those factual updates may be mixed in with explainers and opinions, so you're going to have to scroll to find the most recent information. And so it would be impossible to list every recommended news source around the world. There are thousands, probably tens of thousands. So the ones I am sharing today are the major outlets directed towards an English-speaking U.S.-based audience, simply because that is who our students are here at the university. And so if you want something different and don't know where to look, uh, the UDC library can help. You know, just reach out and we're happy to make some personal recommendations of news resources. So these lists focused only on outlets. That means the companies that make the news and not their platforms. You know, many of these news outlets provide coverage online through websites and newsletters and social media. But they also do it through audio and video, and some even do it in print. And so basically any way they have to reach an audience is what they're going to try to do. So we're focusing on the companies here and not necessarily the platform on which they offer in the news. And so First, I want to discuss wire services, and these are special kinds of news services. They are outlets that provide news reports to other media services. Essentially, other newspapers and websites and news channels can buy and run stories reported by these wire services. They are mostly fact-driven and basic. Um, and so you'll get photos, you'll get video, and you'll get stories, but for the most part, it's mostly fact-driven, and you're not going to see a ton of analysis or a ton of opinions. And the two listed here on the screen, the Associated Press, AP News, or Reuters are the major ones. And there are more of these companies, particularly overseas. So France has Agence France Press. But be careful as some of those newswire services are state-owned, which means they may be more biased in their coverage of certain stories, particularly about those countries. So for some international news coverage, we have places like Al Jazeera, the BBC, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, Google News, NPR, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. These outlets cover major global news because they have journalists based around the world. Again, it's by no means complete. These are the biggies, and many of these also rely on some stories reported by those wire services I mentioned. And the reason you're going to want to stay up to date on international coverage is because what happens around the world will at some point impact us um, if it isn't already. So it, they also cover things that could be of interest to you if you are an international student or just someone who happens to like to travel. It's important to know what is going on in the world. Now for national coverage, you'll notice we repeated a few of the news outlets from the international news here. Um, so ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, those are the main networks uh, we call, you know, the four main networks of TV news. We also have CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. And you'll notice there are two Foxes here. There's, you know, Fox, like the local channel that also does football games, and then there's Fox News. Um, and so these are the big 24-7 TV news channels. We also have NPR, which is known for its audio journalism. And we have the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and USA Today. Again, by no means a complete list. If you're West Coast Blaze, you would want to see the LA Times on this list as well. But these provide robust coverage of the news on a national scale, again, focusing on the U.S. here. If you want national news for other countries, we're happy to provide that. So if you were interested in, say, French national news, you might want to read Le Monde, but you would also need to read French for that. Um, but what these do here is they cover those national news stories that impact the entire country or major news, you know, happening that you would just want to be aware of. Now we're going to look at local news coverage, and these are D.C. outlets, but when you cover D.C., you tend to cover bits of Maryland and Virginia as well, so it tends to get the whole DMV area. These sources may also cover national issues because, well, as the U.S. capital, D.C. is kind of wonky, and that local news can be national news and international news. And again, this is not a complete list. We have a fuller list on our website, and we'll send that link out after uh, the webinar here, but I'm also going to go ahead and drop this in the chat. And the reason you would want to stay up to date on local news is simply to know things like, you know, what's happening with traffic and weather? That's important. What's happening with local elections? Do you want to stay up to date on events? I know every time there's a marathon in D.C., I want to know, so I don't go downtown. 
you know, what local events are happening. These are all that's important. You know, what's happening in your neighborhood? And speaking of what's happening in your neighborhood, that's when we get to hyperlocal news. And hyperlocal news can cover a city or just a single neighborhood or specialized interest in a specific area. And so you can find a lot of hyperlocal news through neighborhood listservs, blogs, and email newsletters. Technically, the UDC email newsletter is hyperlocal news. And again, we list more of these on our DC local news blog post, which I dropped in the chat. But when you're looking at these, you're getting really niche. I happen to be a member of the Cleveland Park Listserv. It focuses on the Cleveland Park neighborhood and a little bit of the surrounding area. I also get the Greater Greater Washington newsletter because I want to know what's happening in transportation and city development interests. Places like the DC line cover things like DC government. Patch DC and Popville are hyper local news stories that can sometimes be quirky. Popville is known for showing photos of fun looking cars that show up in the city and local pets and then people's garden halls. So these are things that can be of interest to you. There are even local parenting newsletters. And again, those are all listed in our DC local news sources. And so I, we hope this is helpful. And as a reminder, uh, you just need to find that works for you. Don't be afraid to try out different news outlets and balances until you find a structure that works. And there really is no harm in subscribing and then unsubscribing from something until you find a mix that works for you. And also, I want to mention that many of the sources mentioned today are paywalled. Again, the truth is paywalled because it's expensive, but you can freely access those through the UDC library or your local public library. And we are happy to connect you with those news sources. If you can't pay for them, contact a librarian. We are here to help you get that access for free. And so thank you for attending today. As a reminder, we're going to have time for questions, both recorded and unrecorded. And the link to this recording will go out sometime this afternoon. And so if you have questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Well, thanks again for a, for a really neat presentation. I'm very glad you mentioned Advantis Media. And, and my, I mean, I sort of have like three questions. One starts with Advantis Media because I teach journalism students, right? And at Fontes, the, the, the political bias chart is a great resource for students studying journalism. Are there other examples of where journalism students can go to start sort of learning the sort of the journalism, you know, the, the, the business of journalism? Secondly, what, what is the best way when I have a student who doesn't want to be balanced in their journalism, but is very focused on, on opinion and advocacy journalism, where I can sort of guide them back toward this, you know, toward studying journalism from a centrist point of view. And then of course, my last question is always, how do I make sure that students that are studying journalism like respect copyright and citation? So I'm going to try to take those in turn. So when it comes to learning more about the business of journalism, there's actually a couple of places I recommend. Um, obviously, the UDC library has many like um, databases and resources where we can connect you with videos for like the basic essential skills. Um, there's also because so many journalists have had to leave their newsrooms and have started newsletters, many of them. Um, have said, you know, this is how I learned to be a journalist. And there's, you know, TED Talks and things like that, where they walk through, this is how I became a journalist. This is what I found worked and didn't work. And there are many, many, many different types of journalism memoirs out there. Um, and so one of the ones I recommend for people who maybe want to go into international journalism or war coverage is a book called Where War Lives. And so you can find those reporters who've done the work before and explain things. Um, and so, it would really be working with the students one on one to see what sort of journalism they are in, too, because, you know, business journalism is going to be different from entertainment journalism, but there's always someone out there. And that's literally our job is to connect people with the information they need. And so we're happy to do that. Um, in terms of balance, uh, this is where I always say no one is neutral. It's literally impossible to be 100% neutral, but I always try to remind people, you always want to know what the other side says. And that's because if you are biased, you want to know how to counter what the other side's going to say. But in terms of hovering something from a central standpoint, this is where you and I <laughs> may end up disagreeing. And that's simply because 
Journalism these days in trying to be fair and balanced oftentimes then tries to equate two things that aren't necessarily equitable, you know, um, and so this is going to vary from subject to subject, but in some instances there is a truth like when we look outside today we can say it is hot. You know, and someone can argue and say, no, no, it is cold because, in you know, but here in D.C., it is hot, you know, something like that. Um, and so trying to counter that is, you know, of two points is if you want to be biased, why? What are you trying to do? Because what journalism tries to do is report the facts as they are. But what it's been skewed to do because of the whole idea that they have to be fair and balanced is sometimes they start doing this false, false equivalency. Um, and so this might be my opinion coming in. Um, my undergraduate degree is in media studies and I did take a couple of journalism courses and there's you know, that idea that you have to be fair and balanced, but sometimes one thing is true and another thing is not. Um, and so that would be something I'd be happy to come into your class and maybe just have a discussion period about. Um, because what we can then talk about is if you are trying to cover something in a certain way, at what point do you then step into actually being a source of misinformation? Um, because at some point, if you are covering things in so biased a way, you are no longer a journalist. You are simply a source of you know, biased opinion or misinformation, or you just have a different viewpoint on things and you're just not a journalist anymore. So maybe journalism as you know strict reporting on the news is not for you maybe you are more into analysis and again analysis can go all over the place so i know that was kind of unwieldy and probably didn't answer your question in that area um but that you know this is where all of those niche personalization issues are coming up is if you're so in your bubble you're not seeing that maybe there even is something else out there um you know it is harder to understand these things and then in terms of respecting copyright, this is where things get incredibly difficult because back in the day, copyright was designed to allow people to make money off of what they did for a set limit of time while allowing, you know, creativity and exploration and curiosity to then develop society further. What has happened, and this is all because of Disney, it is the fault of Mickey Mouse, is that copyright has been rewritten in law to protect business interests. And so when it comes to respecting copyright, there are certain things you must do um, where you cannot use someone else's created material to make money unless it is in the public domain or it is an open access resource, um, or you have to give proper attribution. And in journalism, when you give proper attribution, you're simply saying, this is where I got that source of information. Um, and copyright is incredibly complicated. It used to be, you know, I think originally it was 50 years, but now it's 70 years plus life of the author or life of the author plus 70 years. But then it intersects with international copyright. And I, I have taken classes on copyright law and it is extremely confusing. Um, so when it comes to respecting copyright at the student level, the easiest way to say, if you do not respect the copyright and provide proper attribution and citations, that's plagiarism. Plain and simple, it's plagiarism. But as a journalist, it is unethical to present work as your own when it is not your own. And, you know, most of the time, you know, copyright violations, you just didn't know. You know, oh, I didn't realize I had to do it. I didn't know I had to do that with citations. And so it's simply teaching this is the proper use of attribution and citation in journalism. Um, but it can get you fired. There are many stories of journalists who have used work that is not their own being fired because they were caught doing that. And so you can lose your job. That means losing your source of income. And then it makes you extremely hard to get hired in other organizations. And so when you bring it back to some of those, you know, you might lose some money interest. People tend to pay attention. But also with copyright, we have fair use where we can use something if it follows the four factors. And what, I need to do a whole new webinar on this, but blanking um, a little bit, um, it's basically nature and purpose of the use, the extent to the, the use, how you've used it, you know, is it transformative and things like that. And essentially, if you're taking someone else's photo, claiming it as your own and presenting it and selling it, that doesn't, you know, in any way equate to fair use. But say you're taking that photo, giving credit for it, using it in an assignment, 
that's an educational purpose. It's transformative, or maybe you're commenting on it because commentary is one way you can use fair use. And as long as you're providing access and not trying to make commercial money off of it, you're good to go. Education is one of those workarounds when it comes to fair use. And so this gets complicated and into the weeds and the nitty gritty, but that's basically what it comes down to is you can't make money off of someone else's work claiming it as your own. Um, and so again, that's a whole other webinar in and of itself. Copyright is complicated, but when you look into fair use and the four factors, you can sort of judge, okay, is this appropriate? I hope I covered all of it. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Gonna scroll through the chat to make sure I haven't missed anything here. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. No hands are raised. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording and then give time for uh, unrecorded Q and A.